technology is not something which came today it came with lot of trials philosophy right from the time uh, you know uh, when halstead started nsapp 04 which told us what is the right ancillary clearance what is the minimum number of nodes for staging which tnjs is tnm users today if there is a positive ancillary node what should be the minimum number like for example six nodes is the minimum to stage the axilla if it is n0 if you don't have central lymph node facility or if you are not doing the moment a lymph node is positive what is a adequate comprehensive axillary clearance it is 15 nodes nsa we be told if there is a node positive if you remove 15 nodes axillary recurrence is 0.4% if you remove 10 nodes axillary recurrence is 5% any node less than 10 in a node positive axillary recurrence is 10 to 30% and this is what hscc has picked up how do we know this to follow and trace the history of that particular disease breast gastric cancer colon cancer so one of the way is to analyze the landmark papers why they are right and why why we are here today why we have to give new adjustment why margin is no ink and not 1 cm 2 cm why to do sentinel node positive and you know why to do breast conservative why oncoplasty can be done when to give hormone therapy in luminal a so today it is a very joint effort of absi we have dr rohit kumar who is a very senior surgical oncologist working as aster international institute of onco also the honorary secretary of association of breast surgeons of india a very good teacher so he and his colleague ashutosh mishra also we help of arvind krishnamurthy professor and head of department of uh, adair cancer hospital spent lot of time and they have put up this particular presentation jointly all three of them so thanks very much to the effort of absi and uh, over to you rohit whatever doubts question you have put it in the chat box and q and a in the given time he will try to answer thank you welcome on behalf of national board of examination and myself and absi over to you dr rohit uh, good morning all uh, am i audible am i audible loud and clear yeah thank you thank you sir uh, at, at outset i would like to thank uh, the national board of exam uh, national board for giving uh, the association of breast surgeons of india opportunity uh, to take part in the academic activities uh, it is with great pleasure that we take pride uh, in being the academic leaders uh, and so going ahead with today's uh, presentations it was a combined effort uh, by uh, dr ashutosh mishra who is assistant professor department of surgical oncology at aims new delhi and also myself uh, dr rohit kumar uh, dr ashutosh is uh, attending a leadership summit so he is not be able to uh, attend the webinar so i'll be uh, talking on his behalf and uh, we would also would like to acknowledge dr arvind krishnamurthy sir who had helped us to prepare the slides as well Uh, so i would always start whenever i am doing my uh, talks to know uh, this person and the principles of why uh, that you know the moment you know why you are doing something then the what and how of it just follows be it life be it surgery be it anywhere in life you can always apply these principles and uh, i would also request all dnb students to listen to his ted talk about the golden circle which allows us to understand a lot of things about uh, subjects as well as life so why are we talking about this this is because we need to understand that cancer surgery is not about mutilation or neither about extensive conservation there is a ideal line that we have to draw which dr somshekar sir always speaks about and have picked up from him that there is need to be a minimum effective treatment that has to be done and not a maximum tolerable treatment extensive ablation can lead to unnecessary treatments or mutilating surgeries whereas too much conservation can be very dangerous so there is a ideal line to be drawn and how do we know how to draw a ideal line we only know those things from the path we have traveled from the from our leaders from the experts who have been traveling before and have come across to this stage so we will start off with the papers or whatever led to the large changes in the practice of breast cancer surgery starting off with nsbp 04 in 1976 then nsbp 06 in 1985 and then going along with uh, nsabp that is national surgical adjuvant for breast and bowel project this is also you have to be remembered and then going ahead subsequently with all the trials that we are going to discuss today following uh, up to we'll uh, be discussing uh, 
the uh, NSABP 332. Uh, we'll be discussing the Z11 trial. We'll be discussing the Almanac and also Amaros trials and also certain other aspects of it. Okay, why do we need? Because it is important to understand how as a medical community we have evolved. How far have we reached? What is the path travelled by us? And also, the path travelled helps us to know the ongoing research clinical trials. They help in understanding of the biology, which has helped us transform our understanding and treatment of breast cancer. As well told by uh, Blake Candy, that biology is the king of, of cancer treatment. So we all started off with Halstead theory of cancer spread, wherein it was told that tumors will spread in orderly and defined manner based on mechanical consideration. Tumor will spread to the lymph nodes and from lymph nodes it is going to spread to the lung, liver, bone, that is systemic presentations. Then with the evolving concept of understanding, we moved on to Fisher concept where Bernard Fisher believed that cancer is a systemic disease to begin with and it spread majorly via bloodstream. This is the thought on which the uh, starting of neoadjuvant chemotherapy led to. So, uh, tumor going and spreading uh, directly into the neovascularized blood vessels and then spreading. This was the concept that led to change in thinking process of all of us. Now, what is the change in paradigm? From 1960 onwards, alternative hypothesis that is breast uh, has to be considered as a systemic disease from its earlier stages and it can metastasize even without involving lymph node was thought about. This led to the development of randomized control trials in various in breast cancer. So the first question that we are going to ask is, is less extensive surgery with or without radiotherapy is as effective as radical mastectomy? We all knew to begin with radical mastectomy was considered as the gold standard treatment at that point of time. Now, let us ask the question, can we minimize the morbidity and still maintain the oncological safety? That is what we always think about. That is never to compromise oncological safety at the risk of conservation. This was answered by NSABP 04 trial, wherein all clinically node negative diseases were randomized to undergo radical mastectomy or mastectomy plus radiation or mastectomy alone. The other arm was also clinically node positive disease. They were randomized into radical mastectomy or mastectomy plus radiation. I will put up the entire 25 year follow up study. The aim was to understand if less extensive surgery with or without radiation is as effective as Halstead's radical mastectomy. It was conducted between 1971 to 74, included around 1,765 patients. None of them received systemic therapy. All the clinically node negative patients, they were randomized to radical mastectomy, total mastectomy with and without radiation. Whereas node positive patients, they underwent radical mastectomy or mastectomy with regional RT. You can see the coupling mirror curves that there was hardly any difference in terms of distant disease-free survival or overall survival. The results, there was no significant difference in disease-free survival, relapse-free survival, distant disease-free survival or overall survival between negative or positive nodes. So what did we conclude? That there was no advantage of radical mastectomy over less extensive surgery. You can see the survival analysis year by year. When compared to radical mastectomy, total mastectomy, total mastectomy with radiation, the distant disease was around 46, 38 and 43, whereas overall survival was 25, 19 and 26. This also in terms of overall survival. The first one is about node negative patients. This is the node positive patients where radical mastectomy and total mastectomy with radiation didn't show much difference in distant disease free survival or overall survival. So things to ponder about this are that not all patients having node positive disease invariably develop axillary nodes or axillary recurrences. 
and that systemic disease can spread even without the axillary diseases. There's a controversial spin-off to this that 40% of the patients who are clinically node negative who underwent radical mastectomy, they had a pathologically positive axillary nodes. However, only 19% of those randomized to total mastectomy alone developed a local regional recurrence in the axilla. This led to thinking that leaving beyond occult positive nodes does not always result in axillary recurrence or significantly decrease in overall survival. Now, having understood that we don't have to do radical mastectomy, we then move to a simpler mastectomy or mastectomy with radiation for a node positive patients. Now, having moved towards better conservation, now the next question was to ask if breast conservation therapy is as effective as mastectomy. We moved from radical mastectomy to a simpler mastectomy and from there we are thinking about NSABP 06 which led to the discussion of breast conservation therapy as an effective treatment as mastectomy. So this is the 20 year follow up showing a uh, thing. The question here was is lumpectomy with or without radiation therapy as effective as total mastectomy for treatment of invasive breast cancer. This was published in 2002 in NEGM. Conducted between 1976 to 84, involved 1,851 patients. All node positive patients received chemotherapy. They were divided into total mastectomy, lumpectomy, lumpectomy plus radiation therapy. Most of the tumors all of them involved, the involved criteria was tumor should be less than 4 cm. Overall, if we see, when compared to lumpectomy plus RT or lumpectomy only, recurrence in ipsilateral breast, when radiation was added along with lumpectomy, it was only 14%, whereas with lumpectomy, it was nearly coming up to 40%. There was no significant difference in disease-free survival distant disease-free survival or overall survival. Radiation therapy was associated with decrease in deaths due to breast cancer. There was increase in contralateral breast cancer was not observed in this study due to RT. Many recurrences happened after five years of initial surgery. The conclusion was lumpectomy followed by breast radiotherapy is appropriate treatment for women with breast cancer provided that the margin of resected specimens are free of tumor and an acceptable cosmetic results can be obtained. The take-home messages from NSABP 06 was addition of RT after BCS significantly decreased the rate of local regional recurrence, that is from 39% to 14%. NCCN guidelines were updated to state that BCT is the preferred treatment option following this trial. There were subsequently a lot of trials being discussed about this. Regarding role of RT to breast conservation surgery, EPC-TCG meta-analysis told that significantly RT significantly reduced the rate of any recurrence from 35% to 19% with an absolute risk reduction of around 15.7%. It also moderately reducing the risk of death from breast cancer. What is the significance of local regional recurrence? Local regional recurrence is a risk factor for distant metastasis and death. It has been estimated that for every four local regional recurrences, one patient will die of breast cancer. More recent studies have reported lower local regional rates of 2% to 6% at 10-year follow-up. So now, we understood that BCT, that is breast conservation therapy, that involves breast conservation surgery plus radiation, it offers acceptable oncological and cosmetic outcomes. Now, now, having understood about invasive breast cancer, that is, we moved from radical mastectomy, total mastectomy. From total mastectomy, we moved towards conservation, that is, breast conserving surgery. We'll discuss a few trials focusing on ductal carcinoma in situ as well. So the question was whether Radiation therapy and tamoxifen can reduce the rate of recurrence in DCIS compared with breast conservation surgery alone. This was a trial that is NSABP P17. 
the question was is lumpectomy followed by rt an appropriate treatment for patients with dcis we had nearly 818 patients followed up for 8 years 405 patients were in lumpectomy arm and 413 patients received lumpectomy followed by rt for a dose of around 50 grays they were followed up for a period of 8 years you can see the table comparing the lumpectomy versus lumpectomy and radiation the invasive ipsilateral breast tumor 13.4 to 3.9% non invasive ipsilateral breast tumor 13.4 to 8.2% any ipsilateral breast tumor 26.8% to 12.1% the overall survival was equivalent between the two arms of the study 94 of the patients treated with surgery alone and 95% for patients treated with surgery followed by rt the conclusion was use of radiation therapy following lumpectomy led to a reduced rate of both subsequent invasive and non invasive ipsilateral breast tumors in women with localized dcis detected on mammography when we looked into long term outcomes the ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence is common after lumpectomy for dcis to evaluate in breast tumor recurrence and its impact on survival in two nsbp trials for dcis nsbp b17 and b24 in b24 tamoxifen was added along with placebo you can see the table comparing the cumulative incidences for a 15 year this is the first one which shows lumpectomy and lumpectomy as rt and last two will be rt followed by placebo or rt with tamoxifen you can see in all aspects of it adding radiation therapy and tamoxifen reduced both invasive ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence and long term prognosis was excellent after breast conservation surgery for dcis as well both b17 and b24 established radiation therapy and tamoxifen's role in breast cancer as well <laughs> now for dcis it is considered to be a precursor to invasive breast cancer nearly 20 to 25% of all new breast cancer all be diagnosed 40 to 53% of dcis progressive to invasive cancer over a period of 10 or more years there is ongoing debate regarding the possible over diagnosis and thus over treatment of dcis there is increasing interest in de escalating the management of dcis now there are ongoing randomized controlled trials for breast carcinoma in situ possible non operative management for low grade and intermediate grade dcis the potentially practice changing trials will be in us comparison of operative versus monitoring and endocrine therapy that is the comet in uk the loris trial in europe lord and in japan noreta these trials will be looking to answer if non operative management can be done for low grade and intermediate grade dcis omission of surgery now next we move on to omission of surgery in complete responders to nsct is it ever possible spare only a minority of patients from undergoing excision because huge cost is involved in terms of biopsies and surveillance and potentially increased anxiety may contract any potential benefits of surgical deescalation we had a great debate about this in our annual conference as well that are we surgeons going to become obsolete in near future so now once we have understood that breast conservation surgery is feasible is possible is safe is adequate oncologically and giving acceptable cosmetical outcomes now the question is what is the adequate surgical margin in breast conserving surgery that is the next question that was supposed to be answered we moved from radical mastectomy to total mastectomy to breast conservation surgery and now in breast conservation surgery there has to be that ideal line that we have to draw so that we don't over excise just for the sake of margins leading to very poor cosmetical outcomes nor under excise leading to increased oncological recurrences so we need to get to know what was the adequate surgical margin in breast conserving surgery this came out by guidelines our consensus guidelines initially sso and astro came out and told that margins more widely 
clear than no ink on tumor did not reduce rates of local recurrence and were not routinely necessary so this established following many trials analysis told that no ink on tumor is enough surgical margin for us to do a breast conservation surgery now what was the implications of this this led to substantial and rapid decrease in reoperations both reaccession and subsequent conversions to mastectomy most of them were adopted by many institutions it was economically more beneficial as well now having understood that you know the no ink on tumor is enough margin for invasive breast cancer we have also discuss a intriguing issues of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy what is its role as such so the statement was come up was to avoid contralateral prophylactic mastectomy in women with average risk unilateral breast cancer this was given in 2007 by society of surgical oncology position statement on prophylactic mastectomy in spite of this statement there has been a rapid increase even in average risk disease from 11% to 26% despite lack of survival and psychological benefit now moving on to axilla having addressed the primary organ that is the breast moving from nsbp 04 06 and b17 which told us radical mastectomy total mastectomy and then breast conservation surgery this is how we evolved over a period of time now we will address the trials discussing about surgery for the axilla which is also a very important component in treating breast cancer why axillary surgery involvement of axillary lymph node is a crucial prognostic factor for local regional recurrence and overall survival both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes axillary lymph node dissection is a historical standard it is associated with high morbidity including lymphedema shoulder dysfunction pain and paresthesis we all know about the implications of axillary lymph node dissection and how far we have moved from axillary lymph node dissection to sentinel lymph node and from there to the recently presented sound trial which also discussed about just doing a ultrasound and managing with that now the question that we asked was whether sentinel lymph node biopsy provided the same oncological benefits to that of the axillary lymph node dissection we wanted to know if a minimal surgery can address the same question which the axillary lymph node dissection was answering can we do it with minimum morbidity with better safety profile this was the question so this led to the trial nsabp 32 which discuss the role of sentinel lymph node biopsy the aim was does sentinel lymph node resection in patient with breast cancer achieve same survival and regional control as axillary lymph node dissection but with fewer side effects it was conducted between 1999 to 2004 involving nearly 80 centers in usa and canada with almost nearly 5600 patients we had a sub certification age less than 50 more than 50 size less than 2 cm 2 to 4 cm and more than 4 cm undergoing lumpectomy and mastectomy sentinel lymph node in this trial was done by a dual tracer which was considered to be the gold standard at that point of time that is blue dye and a radioactive tracer sln plus aldi was done in 2800 patients sln alone and aldi if sln is positive was done in group 2 the end point was overall survival sln negative patients the mean follow up was around 95 months so if you look at the type of failures in group 1 and group 2 you can see that almost all sln negative patients had equal survival rates or equal recurrence rates the local recurrence rates regional nodal recurrence distant metastasis most of them were almost the same in summary what we concluded was that nsabp b32 results suggest that when sln is negative that is when sentinel lymph node is negative sln surgery alone with no further 
axillary dissection is an appropriate, safe and effective therapy for patients with breast cancer. Following this, we also looked into if SLNB negative breast cancer, this, uh, this, this is the more in detail uh, description. If you look at it, that uh, the results came out and told that eight year couple and mare estimates for OS was 91 in group one and 90.3 in group two. Same for DFS was 82 versus 81.5%. So, in conclusion, we can see in Kaplan Mayor Cup, there's hardly any gap between the two. The OS, DFS, and regional control was equivalent between the two groups. For clinically node negative, SLN negative breast cancer patients, sentinel lymph node alone with no further axillary dissection is appropriate, safe, and an effective therapy. This was established by NSABP B32. The take care message was there was no statistical significant difference. SLNB is safe and addition of ALND in patients with a negative SLNB did not improve outcomes but did increase morbidity. So now sentinel lymph node biopsy became the standard of care for patients with clinically node negative disease. We have to understand that in clinically node negative disease, ultrasound is also considered to be a clinical bedside evaluation method. So, if it is told clinically node negative, that means it is not only clinical examination, it is clinical examination plus axillary ultrasound as well. Now, the next question to ask was to determine whether a positive SLNB could be spared a completion of ALND. Now, having understood that, sentinel lymph node biopsy can stage the axilla. We have understood that, okay, because if you do a sentinel lymph node, we know if the disease needs, uh, is gone there or not. Now, the next question to ask was, do all positive SLNB patients need axillary lymph node dissection? Are there a set of patients where we can avoid axillary lymph node dissection even if positive SLNB is possible? This was... The question arise because in most of the patients when the histopathology was looked into it, following the axillary uh, dissection after SLNB positive patients, most of the patients saw, most of the surgeons saw that usually the positive node was the only node that was positive in axillary lymph node dissection specimens. This led to question that can we avoid ALND for positive SLNB patients? Now, this was answered by the C11 trial, which was a multi-center non inferiority trial involving 891 participants. It mainly involved T1 and T2 patients who are N0 and M0, undergoing mainly breast conservation therapy. Participants with 1 to 2 positive sentinel lymph nodes were randomized to undergo axillary lymph node dissection or no further axillary surgery. Results of Z11 trial was first reported in 2005 with a median follow-up of 6.3 years. Longer follow-up at that point of time was needed because the majority of patients had ear positive tumors. We all know that hormone positive patients usually recur very late. This was followed by an update in 2011 and 2017 as well. So what was the aim? The aim was to determine if 10 year OS of patients with SLN metastasis treated with BCT and SLND alone without ALND is non-inferior to that of women treated with axillary dissection. This was the trial that was uh, done, which involved uh, uh, all the tumors which are less than uh, uh, more, uh, uh, T1 and T2 tumors, less than 5 centimeters. They were randomized to ALND or no further axillary specific intervention. There was no third field nodal radiation therapy. ALND was defined as an anatomical level 1 and level 2 dissection including at least 10 nodes. All women were to receive whole breast opposing tangential field RT. Now, primary endpoints were OS, DFS and local regional control. Secondary endpoint was disease free survival. 891 patients were randomized on 446 on 445 on the either arms. Initially, the plan was to uh, accrue around 1,900 patients, but the study ended up with only 891 patients. Now, 
having uh, looking into the survival outcomes the primary endpoint that is the overall survival you can see the 10 year disease free survival for patients with going undergoing central lymph node alone was 86.3 versus 83.6 for undergoing axillary dissection secondary endpoint dfs was also 80.2 in sentinel alone and axillary 78.1 there was not much clinically significant value so the conclusion was among patients with limited sentinel lymph node metastatic breast carcinoma who are treated with breast conservation and systemic therapy the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy alone compared with ALND was not inferior but there were a lot of criticism on this trials mainly it was underpowered as i told you the initial plan was to accrued at least 1900 patients but finally at the end of the study it was only 891 patients there was a very low axillary failure rate as low risk patients with low axillary burden were included there was no stratification according to the size of sentinel lymph nodes it is not applicable in the setting of rt with non tangential fields and mastectomy patients not needing rt most of the patients lost to follow up that is nearly around 20% the radiotherapy details were lacking in 71% of the patients and also issues with radiation field design was not properly explained majority of the patients had hormone positive tumors who had late recurrences which was developed now what was the clinical impact of z11 trial there was a lot of buzz after z11 trial md anderson cancer center the rate of alnds in snb positive patients was 85% before z11 reduced to 24% after z11 so z11 was discussed to be a option where even if we get a one or two positive sentinel lymph node we can still avoid the patients undergoing as a lymph node dissection now having had lot of uh, uh, policies of its own it was not very well adopted all over the world the next question was to ask if radiotherapy versus alnd can we replace radiation therapy in spite instead of surgery among patients who are positive sln we know that radiation therapy is less uh, invasive and it can cause lesser morbidity when compared to alnd but is the rt safe can it replace surgical arm this is the question that was asked for patients who are positive central lymph node this was answered by the uh, amaros trial which was amaros that is after management of axilla that is ama after management of axilla that is sentinel lymph node radiation or surgery r o s amaros so the aim was to see if regional nodal radiation therapy is equivalent in terms of disease control to axillary dissection in t1 and t2 breast cancer patients with clinically node negative disease so this was the trial that was done which included 34 centers in europe nearly 4800 patients having t1 and t2 disease and n0 nodes the primary endpoint was five year axillary recurrence secondary endpoint was axillary recurrence with survival dfs os shoulder mobility and lymphedema median follow up was around 6.1 years axillary recurrence in alnd arm was 4 out of 744 in axillary rt arm it was 7 out of 681 the 5 year axillary recurrence was between uh, 0 to 43% after alnd versus 1 to 90% of axillary rt lymphedema was more in alnd arm after 1 3 and 5 years in conclusion patients with breast cancer who are t1 and t2 clinically node negative after slnb if they became positive alnd and axillary rt both provide excellent and comparable axillary control with axillary rt providing less morbidity after 5 years the axillary recurrence was 0.43% after alnd and 1.19 after rt you can see there was significant lymphedema that was nearly double lymphedema in patients who underwent alnd when compared to rt our 2023 updated results of 10 year analysis confirm as low axillary recurrence after both 
RT and ALND with no difference in OS, DFS and local regional control. This was published recently in April 2023 in Journal of Clinical Oncology. The exploratory analysis showed that a 10-year cumulative incidence of second primary cancers of 12.1% after RT and 8.3% after ALND. What is the clinical relevance? Unlike Z11, Amaro's trial enrolled both participants who underwent breast conservation and mastectomy. This trial has provided data to support commission of ALND in patients who undergo a mastectomy contingent on the receipt of post-mastectomy radiotherapy. Now, having understood that SLND can be done in patients who have upfront surgery, now can we utilize the same SLND in post neoadjuvant setting? This was answered by Z1071 trial and also the Sentina trial, which uh, included these four arms. Patients who are clinically node negative, they underwent sentinel lymph node biopsy initially, who are node negative, they and didn't undergo any axial lymph node dissection. Patients who are node positive on central lymph node, they underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy. After that, they underwent a sentinel lymph node biopsy and axial lymph node dissection. This was arm B. This was for node negative patients to start with. Now, if they are already node positive clinically, then they didn't undergo any SLN here. They underwent neoadjuvant chemo. After that, if they were clinically node negative, they underwent central lymph node. That was the arm C. If they were clinically node positive, they directly underwent axial lymph node dissection. You can see the arm A, arm B and arm C where the central lymph node was done. What important is to look is that as and when the number of lymph nodes increased, the efficacy of the central lymph node increased. <clears throat> You can see, as in when the number of lymph nodes increased, the false negative rates fell down significantly. And also, with inclusion of dual dye, the false negative rates fell down significantly. So, in short, SLN in neoadjuvant chemotherapy setting, it has to be use of clinical axillary examination and axillary ultrasound. This will help us to guide patient for selection for sentinel lymph node. If clinically a patient is positive, not positive, then it is important to do a targeted axillary dissection, what is called TAD, which involves placement of a clip in the biopsy proven positive node at diagnosis and resetting the clip node at the time of sentinel lymph node. Dual tracer lymphatic mapping is very important. It is important to at least remove two or more lymph nodes. I would request all DNB residents to read the landmark series trials papers that was published by surgical Ananta Surgical Oncology, which has shown all the trials discussing about axillary management as well. Now, there is further de-escalation happening for axillary surgery, which was also discussed in uh, Alliance 11202. That is, role of ALND for patients with biopsy-proven node-positive patients who despite converting to clinically node negative after neogen chemotherapy have a positive SLN at surgery. Participants were randomized to either axillary ALND plus nodal radiation or only axillary RT plus regional nodal irradiation. This is pending. Now we are moving towards no axillary surgery. SSO 2016 statements of choosing wisely campaign told against the routine use of SLNB in clinically node negative patients aged 70 years or older with early stage hormone positive HER2 negative invasive breast cancer treated with BCS and hormone therapy. This is not for tumors with high risk features. We also had a CalGB9343 trial which showed no survival benefit among participants who underwent ALND versus axillary surgery. Marginally higher axillary recurrence rate. So, to conclude, we can see we are moving more towards de-escalation. De-escalation is the mantra of time. De-escalation of surgical interventions in the setting of improved systemic therapy can lead to better patient outcomes. We'll be looking into future trials to further de-escalate therapy 
and we will probably continue to push towards more personalized and patient specific treatments ultimately we have to understand that any state of the art medical technology will always still need a highly skilled pair of hands to use it and that lies in us thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr rohit so trainees you may type your questions comments on the chat box Dr. Rohit, you may stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. We have a question from uh, Manish. Uh, who's asking, uh, we need to imply Z11 trial in very selected patients at 80% patients with skin detected T1. Yes, definitely Z11 trial had its own uh, fallacies which we have discussed. That is why Z11 trial was not actually accepted by most of the uh, community uh, all over the world. And uh, yes, we definitely have to use it very judiciously. It is not for all patients. open the chat box now yeah just a minute sir uh, can you elaborate on use of central link in patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy yeah so uh, in patients undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy so the baseline is first what we are trying to do is understand that do a clinically examination that is ultrasound and clinical examination if patient is node positive we'll have two scenarios here they can be node negative to start with but still they can have a more than two centimeter disease we have understood that new adjuvant chemotherapy is now being used for all patients especially her to new positive or triple negative patients even size more than two centimeters or coming up to 1.5 centimeters they are giving new adjuvant chemotherapy so if there is a patient who is a early t1 t2 with n0 they are to start with this is one set of patients and now we also have a set of patients who are node positive for patients who are node negative to start with you can as well do the SLNB after new adjuvant chemotherapy as well. This is now accepted. But for patients who are not positive to start with, for them there is a uh, that needs to be done in a proper way for establishing central lymph node. How do we do that? If the node is positive on FNAC, on clinically if it is positive, you have to prove it with FNAC. Once the node is proved, that node, whichever is pathological, has to be clipped. That is called targeted axillary dissection. That is, we do a targeted axillary dissection. During the time of the definitive surgery, the targeted, that is the clipped node, has to be removed as a part of central lymph node. And also, it has to be always a dual diet razor and minimum of at least three nodes has to be used. So with this, we can reduce the false negative rates as much as possible. This helps us uh, to use SLNB in even in node positive patients, but this is not a standard of care as of now still. We have to establish our own false negative rates as well. Why are we doing so much in these patients is because most of the patients who are HER2 positive and triple negative have a very good pathological CR rates. That is why we are pushing the boundaries even in node positive patients. Uh, sent in a flowchart once more, please. I will share the uh, presentations, both that is given by uh, Dr. Ashutosh Mishra and myself, uh, so that you can go through those things and uh, have a detailed discussion about it. Because Sentina trial has got a lot of arms, it will take a lot of time on itself to discuss about it. 
how well can we implement Z11 trial in Indian scenario where majority of patients are to be from rural setup for missed follow up? So as I told you, uh, Z11 trial is for a very set of patients and it is not implied for all the patients. It has to be, uh, we have to choose the patients very selectively. It is well, it is very well understood. That is the reason Z11 trial was not accepted so very well. But there are a set of patients who you'll always get in a clinical practice whom you can always uh, discuss and use this uh, setup as well. Management of axilla in clinically N0, T1, T2, TNBC or HER2 positive breast cancer patients. Yes, so this is what I discussed with you, uh, Chandana. This is the same patients as I told you. If they are clinically N0 to start with, for them, we can always use central lymph node after neoadjuvant chemotherapy as well. When can we omit RT in mastectomy patients undergoing undergoing ILND? Okay, if we have less than one or two nodes positive, uh, then we can emit it. What is the current status of role of local anesthetic injection during surgery for breast cancer to improve oncological outcomes? Yeah, so this is a uh, trial which is out of discussion of uh, uh, this presentation. Uh, I think this presentation was, uh, uh, this was, uh, this trial was uh, mainly because of the Dr. Budway's paper, which discussed about injection of local anesthetic uh, for uh, the breast conservation surgery, which showed that injection of local anesthetic uh, improved oncological outcomes. That is a totally different uh, discussion uh, separate as well. I'll be sharing both the presentations. Uh, uh, see, the idea as Sir has told, uh, Dr. Somshika Sir has told, is to initiate or ignite the fire in you so that you understand the principles of these things. That is all. I would request all of you to go and discuss and read the papers on landmark series presented by the Annals of Surgical Oncology. I myself will be sharing a few of the papers on the DNB group as well. Uh, briefly tell about sound trial. Uh, we'll have a separate discussion about uh, sound trial as well. Post-mastectomy radiation therapy. Uh, uh, we will have a discussion separately uh, with respect to the post-mastectomy uh, and radiation management in uh, breast cancer as well. Uh, you will understand it more better during that point of time. Uh, it is better uh, we stick to this thing as, well, as of now. How many nodes can be safely clipped for targeted axillary dissection? Usually at least one to two nodes will be clipped. Uh, you have to understand that it is a very technically uh, challenging uh, situation. It is not possible for all the centers to do a targeted axillary dissection. That is why uh, the Tata Memorial uh, experience of doing a low axillary clearance in this set of patients has proved to be beneficial in our set of patients. I mean, in Indian scenario, especially in Indian scenario, where we have a lot of resource constraints. Because finding a clipped node uh, during the axillary surgery, uh, especially after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, is a very difficult task. And now I have not discussed about a role of ICG uh, in central lymph node biopsy. Uh, most of the trials have showed that a single uh, agent or single dye use, that is ICG in isolation itself, is well equivalent to the gold standard of dual tracer. Role of reverse axillary mapping, uh, definitely yes, uh, but it is with with, it, with its own fallacies uh, because we have had many patients, there is a crossover of lymphatics, especially the arm and axillary lymphatics, uh, there is a lot of crossover of lymphatics, it is not a, a very safely well established procedure, but we need to overcome the learning curve to understand and do this. Milan versus B06, any difference? The major difference was the size of the tumor. That was mainly less than 2 centimeters. Here it is less than 4 centimeters. That was the major difference. Apart from that, we didn't have any major difference.
Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, post good response to new adjuvant chemotherapy of primary, our surgical excision for breast will be based on original tumor size only. Ankur, you have to understand the principle why we are doing adjuvant chemotherapy. Doing new adjuvant chemotherapy, you have two things to answer. One, to address the systemic disease. Second, to improve the cosmetical outcomes. So you can do a better breast conservation surgery. That itself explains the fact that we are not going to take the original margin. So when we are dealing patients who are going new adjuvant chemotherapy, addressing primary is always whatever is left behind. That is why it is very important to clip the tumor, whoever patient is going for new adjuvant chemotherapy. When do you clip the primary tumor? Because the response to chemotherapy is not equal for all the patients. We all know the centripetal and the centrifugal response pattern. That is why ideally after the first chemotherapy, we have to clip at least one or two clips has to be placed in the center of the breast tumor as well. And then as and when the chemotherapy is completed, especially for HER2 positive and triple negative patients, after chemotherapy is completed, you do a repeat ultrasound. If they don't have a palpable lump, then the guidance is by either the placement of a surgical wire or through skin markings. This helps us to remove as minimal breast tissue with safety and not compromising on oncological outcomes. So the margin is always on the tumor that is left behind after the chemotherapy and not on the original tumor size. I'll be sharing few of the landmark series papers on the DNB Surgical Oncology Group. Uh, I'll request all the DNB residents to go through those papers extensively to understand, uh, for better understanding of the uh, concepts. I'll be sharing the presentation, both uh, the present one as well. I don't see any other questions. Can we uh, close, sir? So, if there are no more questions, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohit Kumar, for the presentation, and thank you very much, trainees and faculty members, for joining the session. Thank you all.